Welcome wrestling fans, welcome to Curtain Jerk and as always I am your host Jacob Grindy reporting for the main event Marks YouTube channel and the Dragon Suplex Podcasting Network. It has been a fun, exciting, uh, dramatic week in the world of wrestling. Kevin Nash and Ric Flair both have come out with their own brand of weed. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather be smoking Nash's weed, Nash leaning on the ropes during his promos is kind of the high that I want to be on. Now, if Ric Flair was selling an Adderall subscription or like bumps of blow, I mean, I'd probably be more line, you know, more likely to uh, to fork over my money. Maybe maybe we can keep it PG. Maybe some some espresso bean. But when I take a load off on a hard day, I'm probably going to be burning down some diesel fumes on the highway, if you know what I'm saying. Johnny Gargano, I don't know if you guys watch Monday Night Raw or not, but popped up on Monday Night Raw. What a smart move in hindsight. Wait, start a family, and see what the best move is when you're ready. Don't jump around. Look at Adam Cole. Look at Miro. All these people who went Andrade. All these people that went to AEW. And, I mean, they're not in a worse position. They're on the card, but they're in the middle of the card. Um, they're, you know, start out with a lot of fanfare and then kind of end up in the middle. But if you end up in the middle in WWE, you're, you're, on, you're in the middle of the best. You know, are the biggest, not necessarily the best. And then the Triple H situation, you know, kind of falls into his lap. He's not even working for Vince right now. He's working for someone who knows he can be over, who doesn't really care too much about the smaller guy thing. Um, I think Adam Cole is probably looking at Johnny Organo a little jealous. Uh, a guy who signed uh, to AEW because Vince wanted to use him as a manager, who kind of uh, got body shamed being small in a small guy's promotion like AEW. Now a smaller guy is getting 14,000 people to lose their mind in Toronto, Canada, popping up on Raw, you know, beating AEW in the ratings. I mean, Johnny Gargano won wrestling this week. John Moxley won the AEW title, wrestled Punk. The most over guy in AEW will wrestle Nick Gage, uh, you know, down the line. Uh, most over guy in GCW uh, in a career versus title match. So I don't think um, John Moxley is going to retire Nick Gage, even though I think he might, he should. Um, and then is headed to wrestle Kingdom 17. Uh, no stranger to New Japan. Uh, John Moxley has wrestled there in the G1 and even on Wrestle Kingdom before. But it's still pretty cool news. This guy is all over the place and he's doing really well in 2022 and it's kind of cool to see. We'll talk more about him a little later. We'll talk a lot about AEW now and coming up later. Eddie Kingston not happy with Sammy Guevara after uh, Sammy Guevara during a promo during, you know, TV uh, saying something about his physical appearance. I think he called him fat or something like that. Uh, so Kingston threatened him backstage and even pie-faced him uh, and then even swung on him. Kingston did get suspended, so he was on TV for very long and has admitted publicly that he was wrong. Uh, kind of came out on Twitter yesterday and kind of trying to distract everyone from the current situation. And uh, Sammy Guevara even came out and said... Uh, you know the whole situation is overblown. He was speaking in character. He he wasn't he wouldn't really fat shame Eddie Kingston. I think the person who chose violence here, Eddie Kingston, though, uh, will look better here. Kingston standing up for himself and attacking a pretty boy is something that I think a lot of wrestling fans, AEW fans, can resonate with. But I don't think this hurts Sammy. I mean, Sammy is kind of you know the chicken shit he heel here. Uh, and this would be something that his character would do. And, I mean, it was something that his character did. He did it in the ring. He can honestly just say, hey, I was performing. I don't, I wasn't like, I didn't get caught by someone sneaking up on me with a cell phone calling this guy fat. I was trying to uh, provoke something. And he even said the same guys that uh, fat shame Eddie Kingston are the same guys that call me small. 
So he even kind of, you know, related to him a bit there. All I can really say is this feud is a thousand times more interesting uh, than what it was on the AEW television. Uh, Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa also a little more interesting now than they have been the past few months. I mean, that cage match was great, but for the past few months, it's been kind of interesting to see. I thought it was just AEW didn't know how to book uh, a champion. Like, look at Hangman Page. The chase was great. They don't know what to do. Look at Wardlow. The chase is great. They don't know what to do. Uh, Jade has been kind of stagnant. Thunder Rosa kind of stagnant. We'll talk a little bit more about her. But apparently, they legit don't like each other. And may have... and. Thunder Rosa may have hid backstage in fear after breaking Hater's nose. Uh, it was an accident, but apparently Hater and Baker, according to uh, sources, uh, stiff Thunder Rosa on occasion uh, to the point where it would have to be on purpose. If this is true, uh, this can actually be a really bad look for any wrestler I, I have talked about today. Thunder Rosa is a former MMA fighter, kind of a badass in the ring. And then you, even though, you know, you find out it's a real situation, you find out uh, uh, that she was hiding. There has been rumors that uh, Baker bullies people a lot in the back to the point where allegedly a group of women came and approached Tony Khan about this. But Tony Khan took Baker's side and there is... You know, allegedly, the bullying has only gotten worse from there. This is going to be rough. This is going to be interesting. And unfortunately, this is way more interesting than what's going on in the women's promotion on the television. And we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, AEW had a meeting this week before Dynamite talking about contract tampering. Meltzer said uh, it's definitely more than one person what culture pw insider and wrestling observer helped me with all this news today but i mean contract tampering i mean i guess it's legally wrong but i don't think it's morally wrong if you know someone's unhappy or you get worried that someone's unhappy or you just know that someone's contract is running out um why not reach out to somebody i mean i get i mean i get how you'd be mad if you sign the person to the contract and they're not sticking to their word um but, I mean, as far as, like, it's nothing compared to bullying somebody in the back or, uh, you know, a lot. We've heard a lot worse coming from wrestling in the past few years. I'll just leave it at that. But jumping to AEW, what happened in the body of the show? AEW Dynamite, Jericho uh, bringing out Daniel Garcia, saying, I want him to apologize to me. Hilarious. Danielson's music hits. Garcia ends up shoving Jericho down. We get a match at All Out. Jericho versus Danielson. I think this is perfect. With that world title uh, match kind of up in the air, we don't know if it's happening. Meltzer is reporting that it's happening. They're not really announcing it on the show. Um, I'll give you my thoughts on that later, but I think this is perfect because, like, Jericho and Danielson, literally a main event anywhere in the world. So if you know this match is happening, you're still going to show up. You're not going to sell your ticket. I had not watched uh, this feud because of the G1, as you guys know. So I really don't know what's going on or, you know, other than the memes of people saying, you know, Jericho and Danielson are fighting for custody of Garcia. Garcia came out, you know, he's a good actor. He's a wrestler. He's a sports entertainer. He's a solid actor here. Hayer comes out, attacks Danielson. So we had three former world champions in the ring. We're going to get Danielson versus Hager on Dynamite. And we're getting Jericho versus Danielson at All Out. Thunder Rosa has to relinquish the title. More bad Thunder Rosa news. And they are going to crown an interim champion at All Out. In my eyes, this mess with the men's world title is evidence enough that the interim titles are silly, don't work, cause heat, uh, the wrong kind of heat, the heat in the back that no one really sees, where it's more fun to read about than watch on television. Uh, you can just remind everyone that she never lost the title and she was injured when she comes back, so you don't really have to fuck up your lineage like they're doing here. Uh, great promos from Christian Cage, great promos from Ricky Starks. I mean, Ricky Starks, I mean, if I was booking AEW, he would be 
he would have been pushed a long time ago. And it looks like they're pushing him now, which is great to see. He's wrestling Hobbs at the pay-per-view. That match should be fucking awesome. Going over to AEW Rampage. Rampage is pretty straightforward. Not a lot of non-wrestling stuff, which I like. I like the hour of Rampage. It doesn't do well in the ratings, but I honestly like it. One hour right after SmackDown. I enjoy 205 Live when it was in this time slot. And I enjoy Rampage a lot in this time slot. Hook promo. This guy just seems kind of rude to me. But if he's over with the children, he's over with the children. I do think that his feud with uh, 2.0, Jericho Appreciation Society, uh, Magic Daddy, and Cool Hand Angelo, or whatever the hell they want to be called, they go by many aliases, and they are great in the ring, they're great on the mic. I think they can carry him through a good feud, just like QT Marshall did a few weeks ago. Uh, Jade cutting a promo, getting attacked by Athena, and then all of a sudden you hear, sounds like we have a TBS championship, match it all out, like... What? What kind of lazy ass booking is that? Someone attacks somebody and then the announcer just says, looks like they're wrestling each other. I mean, if whatever. Backstage footage from Punk's injury. Uh, we'll, I mean, we'll get more into talking about that. But I don't think that this is landing with the fans like they planned. Uh, Mox got a mega pop for beating Punk, and I don't think they expected that pop. Of course, Punk is going to get cheered in Chicago, Cleveland, close to Cincinnati, you know, the same state as Ohio. Um, but yeah, we'll just have to get into that match a little later because you know that I'm going to be ranking every single AEW match from worst to first. 10 matches here. Number 10, Baker versus Caden King. This was kind of cool that they hyped up this match on Dark, but Lockjaw, tap out, Baker wins. Number nine, Hobbs versus Ashton Day. Jericho picks uh, Ashton Day to win. That line popped me. Uh, that's That line probably alone from Jericho moved this match from 10 to 9. Huge spine buster, 1, 2, 3. The family, QT Marshall's family, attacking... Ricky Starks after the match showing on the big screen. Hobbs looks pleased. Wardlow and uh, Nick Namath. Namath coming out even though from Cleveland. Barry Cleveland. For the real hometown boy Wardlow to come out and whoop his ass. Powerbomb Symphony. One, two, three. Best uh, enhancement match of the two shows. Colt Gunn versus Billy Gunn. Father and son fighting that's always cool. Who's your daddy chance from Cleveland? Uh, it didn't really make sense, but it kind of was funny. And then Billy Gunn played it into it, pointing at himself, huge pop. Uh, this match was fun to watch because, you know, it's like that Memphis style where you really don't have to do shit to be over. And, you know, it was kind of fun here. Stokely attacks uh, uh, Max Caster with a boombox. Colt 45, 1, 2, 3. Father loses the son. And, uh, you know, the ass boys look good here, even though they kind of stand tall with Stokely and then um, Swerve and Lee come out and somehow the acclaimed and Swerve and Lee are wrestling. They kind of forgot about the ass boys in this feud. Why couldn't you do a triple threat match? I mean, you kind of did triple threat tag matches um, consistently on pay-per-views. Why not here? I think the Ass Boys deserve a pay-per-view match. That's just me. But coming in number six, Punk versus Moxley. This match was more fun to talk about and theorize about what happened and what we were watching than it was to watch. Uh, WCW shoot interviews and documentaries are still going on to this day, but the company went under over 20 years ago. So what I'm kind of saying here is AEW has always been compared to WCW for obvious reasons, but this match was the first time it reminded me of the bad things about WCW. Um, Bobby Fish can say all he talk all he wants about Punk's kicks. Uh, and whether they look real or not it, on Twitter, it makes sense uh, that his foot was planted and that's the foot that got injured. I mean, you know, you see all the time in basketball and tennis and things like that. Like uh, it's how you land, how you turn with the foot planted that injures that foot. I saw a lot of people, you know, complaining that it was the wrong foot. But yeah, 
getting into this match, uh, it was real quick. Punk, you know, kind of acts hurt. Uh, starts selling, you know, the, the foot he had surgery on. Mox picks him up, hits him with the paradigm shift, and then hits him with the deft rider. Doesn't hit the dirty deeds. And then Mox pins Punk 1, 2, 3. The match was like three minutes, three minute world title match. I was listening to Keep It 100, and they compared this match to the Goldberg Brock match of WrestleMania 33. I love that match. That match was in my top 10 uh, matches of the when the year came out. And uh, I think this was a little different. I think people knew that there was some bullshit going on here. Uh, Punk kind of screamed out loud and really sold. Uh, the the foot injury, I think. Uh, Punk kind of shooting on Hangman was a bad look for Punk. I think uh, the crowd really, uh, not happy with Punk doing that. Like I think th- th- there's a AEW has a real smart crowd and they like Hangman. Hangman homegrown talent. Hangman's been with them since 2019, and I don't think they enjoyed Punk doing what he what he did to the point where the Cleveland crowd had a mixed reaction going into Chicago I think it's going to be a little different I think they're trying to do this little work shoot thing but I I mean you you know Bobby Fish calling out punk I mean you have Eddie Kingston saying that Mox slayed the dragon or, or cut the head off the snake rather uh you know, and then when he when Mox pinned him, he looked legit hyped. Like he looked pretty excited to do this to this guy. Uh, like how UFC fighters look when you know they win big fights. I think it's because the fight he was facing was the fight that maybe was in his mind that possibly he would not have been as over as he was in this match. You got to remember he was the world champion during the pandemic era. So he had no crowd. No crowd really saw him as champion. Here he is with the interim title only because Punk, the new toy, is the quote-unquote real champion. And he's stirring up trouble backstage and stuff to the point where they said Punk might not show up. He showed up and then looks like he got a mixed reaction when everyone in that building liked Mox. Uh, This was great to see. I mean, I'm a big punk fan, but this was kind of cool to see Mox get this victory. It was cool to have something to talk about. Um, but the match itself, I think, you know, the reason I ranked it sixth, the reason I put it over Billy and Colton Gunn here is because of that big fight feel. And AEW really hasn't swerved the audience this bad. When they say there's a big fight happening, there pretty much always is that big fight happening, you know, unless someone's hurt or something like that. But this was the first time they really didn't give it to us. And then uh, they did a big injury angle. And he's going to be better in a week and a half because he's going to come out to that Chicago crowd. I guess they're trying to raise the question. Maybe Punk won't come out. Maybe he will. But we've been without Punk for months now. We want Punk. We want it solidified. All this bullshit is exactly that bullshit. And, uh, you know... The honeymoon period of AEW is over. I mean, you got Thunder Rose and Baker legit not liking each other. Sammy Guevara and uh, and Eddie Kingston legit not liking each other. It looks like Punk and Hangman not liking each other. Punk and Mox, there looks like there's a lot of hostility. Maybe I'm picking up incorrectly, but there seems like a lot of hostility there. I digress, guys, because we're going to be talking about match number five, Sammy Guevara, Ty Conti versus Ortiz and Soho. This match was fun. Fun to watch. A little mixed tag match. Uh, Wasn't Ruby, like, in the title picture, like, about a year ago? She kind of fell from grace a lot. Like, uh, it seems like she was a big deal. And then Tony just kept bringing in more and more newer and newer toys and you kind of forgot about ruby soho remember she came out she had the rancid you know theme song everyone loved her she was going to show everyone that she was really good um i mean she kind of i don't think she's that good in the ring i don't think she's that good on the mic so i i think she now has a good position but just uh you know maybe you should just started her out on this position i don't know uh 
It was cool to see Ty and Ortiz kind of wrestle each other. Anna Jay comes out, attacks Ruby Soho. Ortiz busts it open, gets hit with the double springboard cutter. One, two, three. Sammy Guevara and Ty Conti get the win and keep their titles. This was for the AAA uh, intergender tag titles. Uh, lots of titles in the AEW, of course. Number four, Dark Order versus House of Black. Tin and Brody King locking horns. That was cool. Reynolds' beard growing in nicely. Malachi going after the injured knee of Tin. Miro comes out and distracts Malachi. Roll up. One, two, three. Dark Order advance in the tournament. They attack Miro. Sting and Darby come out for the save. I missed a month of AW. And this feud is exactly where I left it. I think Sting and Darby were making the save for Miro. And Miro was distracting Malachi and things like that. Um... A month ago is this going to be on all out what's going on here uh claudio and dustin rhodes the main event of rampage number three this match looked good like i was gonna say this was going to be a great match until the end uh caprice coleman on commentary cool to see always good to have william regal on commentary dustin taking uh cleveland to larry land then gets in the ring hitting a hurricane rana hitting a code red this was cool claudio bleeding behind the ear big swing cross face spot nice slow pace building to a really good pace and then arn jumps on the apron uh it looks like to no avail an odd thing happens here someone was off time dustin's nuts kind of fall into claudio's face or something like that and then claudio is probably pissed and uh, goes for the pin. Uh, the finish kind of put a damper on this match, but it was still a good match. Number two, Lethal and Dax. This match was awesome. I loved how both guys laid their shit in, working snug, making wrestling fun. Dax landing some Germans. Liger bomb one, two. Lethal kicks out. Sanjay shows up. Lethal rolls, rolls him up. A uh, handful of ties. One, two, three. Lethal gets the victory. After this, they announce that the Motor City Machine Guns will be with Lethal against Dax, uh, uh, Dash, and Wardlow. FDR and Wardlow. Um, I mean, that's kind of cool, but I mean, Lethal is uh, a bad guy. And bringing Motor City Machine Guns is going to get a face pop. I don't know where they're going with that. But I mean, I remember back in the day, 2007, 2008, Lethal was tagging with the Machine Guns all the time, and they were doing really cool stuff, the stuff that you kind of see in the trios matches in AEW, in this trios tournament, they kind of were doing first. Um, it's kind of odd to do a trios match here, or you know, a six-man tag here, when you have the six-man tag titles here, don't you want that uh, match on All Out to kind of stand out a bit? I don't know. But we're going on to another trios match because it's the best match on AEW television this week. The United Empire versus Death Triangle. A lot of people are saying, oh, Dave Meltzer gave this match five stars. And they're showing clips of this match. I'm like, yeah, that's fucking awesome. They're like, look how long it took Pac to do a moonsault off the top turnbuckle uh, over the post onto two guys. It's like, yeah, that's it really wasn't that long if you don't put a timer on the fucking clip. And you're ignoring all the setup to it. Anyone who's trying to shit on this match is grasping at straws that are dis that are disintegrating in front of them. Um, great start, and then United Empire cuts the ring in half. All hell breaks loose. Double, double poison Rana from Pac and Osprey as they stare each other down. Os Cutter Avalanche Brainbuster by Pac. Uh, Black Arrow, Osprey gets his knees up, Stormbreaker reversed into a Hurricane Rana, 1-2, no, Kip Sabian is there with his box, Pocky had seen enough, he tries to reveal that it's Kip Sabian, it's actually not Kip Sabian, Kip Sabian is behind him, attacks Pac, an odd turn of events in the middle of this crazy match, United Empire, three-way Os Cutter special move, or whatever the hell happens, 1-2-3, United Empire moves on in the tournament. I mean, this was a great match. I mean, five stars, I don't know. Good match, yes. Entertaining match, yes. Best way to spend the Wednesday night, yes. Best match all week, yes. After the match, though, uh, and probably after the show went off the air, Osprey cut a promo on Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega coming out there. Uh, 
saying uh, that he's done everything that Kenny has in New Japan, which is not true. Kenny has won the G1, and Osprey literally lost the G1 a week before cutting this promo. I don't know if he's trying to pull a Scott Hall thing. I remember Scott Hall used to do that in WCW, claim that he won things that he didn't win, or he was just talking because he was talking super, like, I don't know how to even say the super, like, dirt sheet shoot here. He, like, uh, he then goes on to brag about uh, the match he had with Okada, but he lost that match. So in the kayfabe sense, it's kind of silly to bring up the match that he lost, especially after saying that he did everything that Kenny did in New Japan uh, because Kenny beat Okada. So, I mean, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know if he was doing... If this was... He'll work saying, claiming things that weren't true, then he nailed it. But if he's talking like this is a shoot and just talking about how like he had a good match as if and saying that he had a, you know, a really good match and that's somehow bragging as a wrestling character, that's kind of silly and dumb. I don't know where he was coming from, but I was entertained. I got to say that it was great, uh, great uh, delivery here. It was kind of a low blow here. He called out Kenny Omega from where, for wearing a t-shirt in his match back, saying that he doesn't have abs anymore, which probably is true. I mean, Kenny might, you know, he's getting up there in age. It's harder to continuously look good. He might not have the abs he used to have. Who knows? AEW is crazy. The wrestling world is crazy. You guys are crazy. Fly high. I'm out. I appreciate you listening.